Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Within the Frame. My name is Janet Salas. Richard couldn't be here today, but today we have a special guest, Jared McDonald Evoy. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So he is an Arizona filmmaker and journalist. Um, can you tell me a little bit, you know, about first year AZ Central work? Uh, yeah. So for about almost two years now, uh, I started as an intern at Arizona Republic. Uh, they have a program through ASU. It's called like JMC 325 where you intern with them and it's a paid internship and you cover breaking news and things like that. They do like twice a week and through that they kind of just kept extending my contract and I've been working with them uh, covering breaking news, public safety. Now I'm also doing photo and video work for them. Uh, I shoot photos and videos of, of like events and breaking news like today. Earlier today I was just out at the, I think it was like 4th Avenue and Adams Street police were detonating a backpack that they, oh they thought was a suspicious package and ended up being nothing. So some poor guy got, left his backpack in a parking garage, got it blown up today. So. <laughs> I hope it wasn't anything in there, like I, on top. <laughs> yeah, I hope it wasn't like, you know, he had his like Christmas presents or something in yeah. there and he left them in the parking garage because now they're gone. They've been detonated. So, yeah. Well, that's uh, awesome. So um, you said it was an internship. So are you still a student? Uh, no, I graduated in August. Uh, okay. I got my bachelor's in... Um, uh, mass communication and journalism from the Walter Cronkite School. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I graduated, yeah, just a few months ago. That's really cool. And, um, you know, speaking of Walter Cronkite, I heard recently you finished a documentary called Stingray. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, in January, I was, when I was still in school, there was the, there's the documentary program through ASU's Journalism School at, at downtown Phoenix. And uh, I, I made a documentary, and it premiered in May at the, at the school. And then the school paid to have it entered in uh, to some competitions and stuff, but it, it's my second short documentary. It's called Stingray, and uh, what it's about, it's not about the Stingray fish. Mm -hmm. It's about a device used by police that um, a lot of people often refer to them as Stingrays, mm -hmm. but the actual term for them is, is either MC Catcher or Cell Site Simulator. And it's it's an investigative documentary. It, was, it look, looks into um, uh, the use of these devices, because basically what they are is they act as a cell phone tower. So say police have a suspect that they're looking for, they know a cell phone number, they'll take one of these devices, they'll turn it on, and it will tell all the phones within, say, like a seven mile radius to report to it instead of a cell tower. So all the phones will send its their MC, uh, which is their international mobile subscriber identity, uh, to this device instead of the cell tower. And then the, the police uh, department or uh, federal law enforcement like the FBI use them will then it takes in all the data and they can locate where that person is and it can read text messages and see your contact info and stuff like oh, that wow. um and not a whole lot's known about them mm -hmm. and that's a lot about what the document was about was just trying to figure out what exactly they can and can't do because there's still a lot of we don't know a whole lot about them because there's a lot of secrecy about them so it's it's it was a look into these kind of devices mm -hmm. and uh the different ways they're being utilized because um they're being used in a lot of different ways right now. Okay, so the documentary takes place in the Phoenix area. Are you in it, or is it almost like um, more about the subject rather than you kind of being investigating? It's definitely more about the subject. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I do put myself in it a little bit when I talk about how um, uh, we actually did find that an MC catcher was used mm -hmm. uh, in the downtown Phoenix area near the ASU downtown uh, Phoenix campus, which is also right next to the, the Arizona Republic building, mm -hmm. um, which kind of has some interesting ramifications because, I mean, a building full of journalists and a building full of journalist students could have had a lot of data taken and looked yeah. at, and we weren't able to get any, uh, any people to really admit to them using it. Um, Has that affected you, you know, as a journalist? And, you know, this whole topic is a little secretive and sketch kind of has that had any influence it definitely has it's made me look more into data privacy and it's made me want to urge friends and family to have better data practices mm -hmm. uh, for example one thing that now is part of my daily life is I use an encrypted text messaging app for most of my messaging between colleagues uh, it's called, existed. <laughs> yeah it's called it's called signal I, I highly recommend you I recommend everyone I, I meet to start mm -hmm. using it uh, it's because because iMessages on your iPhone aren't very secure, mm -hmm. and Apple has admitted that they will pretty much willfully give data from iMessages to police when they ask for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Most times, without even a warrant, they just will just give it to them. Um, so if you are really, you want to keep your conversations private, which we should all, because being able to have that 
private conversation uh, with another human being is integral into having freedom of expression, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I, I use things like Signal. I use better passwords on my computers, uh, things like that. It has made me more aware of, I mean, Stingray is, and Stingray technology is really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this kind of technology. Um, I mean, we didn't even get to touch into on the film things like Hacking Team, mm -hmm. a company based out of Israel that sells basically malware to uh, foreign governments across the world, even ones that have dictators uh, that they use to essentially spy on either journalists or dissidents. And most like most time, they usually spy on protesters. And this kind of technology uh, can even see through your webcam or your, your camera yeah. and things like that. So. With the surveillance technology of Stingray, the film definitely only t touches on the ice tip of the iceberg of this. And it's definitely made me more aware of my own privacy. Mm -hmm. Are you planning on doing maybe like a part two or additional documentaries about these kinds of subjects? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely want to do more of a follow-up on Stingray. I am kind of working on a feature-length documentary I want to do. It's not going to be the next one I do. It's going to be one I probably do a little longer down the road because mm -hmm. I need to do more research. Um, but I want to do a longer documentary, yeah, just about this this issue in general, uh, because I feel that in the next four years as well, it's going to get only more and more relevant mm -hmm. uh, as we take this this giant surveillance apparatus that has been built up the past eight years under the Obama administration and was started under the Bush administration in 2001. Uh, it's going to be handed off to another president that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be even more relevant. And I definitely am planning doing more of a follow-up on it. I, I still... the so there's a, a newspaper I also work for called the North Star Post that's mm -hmm. featured heavily in the documentary because its founder, Sam Richards, was the one that discovered that the FBI had been most likely using these stingray devices for planes and flying them over cities. Wow. So they were cl collecting up literally millions of people's data. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing a lot more follow-up work with him on, on these issues as well of stingray and, and other things like that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something I, I plan to continue following in the future. Awesome. So you said it might not be your next, but what is your next? Uh, my next documentary, uh, I kind of have been, I, I finally kind of pinned down the subject I'm going to tackle um, for my next one, which I want to be my first feature documentary. Uh, it's going to be about what's called Cicada 3301. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's fascinated me for a few years now. It, it started a few years back. There was this, it's an internet puzzle that's technically never really been solved. Uh, what it is, is every year this group called Cicada 3301 releases these weird intricate puzzles that, that span all sorts of knowledge, like Shakespearean literature to cryptology to all sorts of stuff. Like people will find images, like the, the, an image that's released by Cicada 3301. And if you take the image into a certain program and enter in this thing, all of a sudden you'll see an encrypted message will appear. And then you have to take yeah. that encrypted message into a third program. And then you get the, the step to the next clue. Okay. And the clues have literally spanned all across the entire globe, but no one knows who's behind it and why they do it. Uh -huh. So it's one of the internet's greatest mysteries that hasn't been solved. And uh, I, I really want to tackle it and try to see who's behind it. I mean, there's a lot of theories. Some people think, uh, my personal theory is that it's just like some kind of tech cult. Mm -hmm. um, but some people think it might be a CIA recruiting tool or <laughs> um, which it, it, there is some merit to it because mm -hmm. Uh, a few years ago, the CIA version, the British CIA version, basically, uh, GH, uh, HQ, they, they had a cryptology competition where if you could crack a code, you would get an interview with them. So there is some sort of credence to that thought that this could be some sort of a recruiting tool. But, um, yeah, that's my next documentary that I want to focus on. I was trying to solve this weird internet mystery known as Cicada 3301. That's awesome. So Stingray, um, back to Stingray, where can people see it? Where can people find anything about it? Well, today is actually the 28th. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the last day you can view it online uh, on this, this film festival. It got it got into the Direct Monthly Online Film Festival. Congratulations. Um, thank you, where it could be viewed for free uh, for a certain period of time. But that's ending on today on the 28th. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's going to get into some more film festivals here. And then after its film festival circuits are done, if it doesn't end up getting you know, picked up for any sort of distribution, my plan is to release online for free for anyone to watch. That's awesome. And so that's short film. It's about 26 minutes long, right? Yep, 26 okay. minutes. Awesome. And then um, the last thing I want to talk about was, uh, you know, you work on shorts. You are a sound editor, a designer, um, sound 
recordist. Yes. Yes, <laughs> that's a term. Um, so tell me more about you know the short films or even the feature film uh, that you worked on where you worked on a lot of sound on. Yeah, I mean, uh, right after film school, that was kind of how I got my foot in the door with a lot of filmmaking was doing sound because a lot of people don't like doing it and you know boom mopping where you hold a lot of people don't know how to do it no, a lot of people don't yeah a yeah. lot of people don't know how to do it so i kind of made that my niche of being how i get in on films was mm -hmm. doing that because a lot of people didn't know how to do it didn't like how to do it so um yeah for the past few years i've done a lot of sound mixing where i'll go someone will hand me the audio they recorded and they're like hey can you clean this up and i'll clean it up or i'll just record the sound and mix it in and post but most recently my sound work i've been doing is uh uh, an Arizona-based uh, horror film, feature film called Witch Child. Mm -hmm. I did some of the on-set sound recording, uh, and I am also doing a lot of the posts. So I'm doing, I'm actually working with this guy. He's a retired uh, sound designer. We used to work for like Warner Brothers and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's kind of mentoring me on it, but I'm creating sound effects for it. And it's horror films, so it's been a lot of fun trying to figure out, you know, oh, what's the best way to make this bone break? <laughs> or how would this, this ghost sound, yeah. you know? So uh, that's kind of my other passion is that, that kind of like sound design stuff because it's, it's a lot more fun and creative, whereas documentary can be very creative mm. and, and journalism can be very creative, but you're more based in facts and real life. Whereas with sound design on like a horror film, it's just you can do whatever you want. You're like, well, I think this ghost, I think she would have you know, a howling, screeching sound. Like, <laughs> let's mess with that. And yeah. You can really let your creative energies flow on that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you know when Witch Child will be coming out? Because one of our crew members actually worked on Witch Child. Yeah, also. Karina, right? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, worked on set with her on that. Uh -huh. uh, I am not entirely sure, and I don't want to say anything. Yeah, okay. I, I'm only a sound mixer, <laughs> really. So um, uh, I'll leave that up to the, the director and producer to, to say. I know that we've had to push the deadline back a few times. Mm -hmm. We've unfortunately had a crew member who was going to do our music mm -hmm. on the film. A good friend of mine I went to film school with named Matt Jackson. He passed away after filming, mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of... Uh, threw a wrench into a lot of the post-production uh, stuff. We had to find new composers, so that's why it's been a little bit more delayed. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hopefully, it'll be coming out here very soon. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I've heard a lot of great things about it. I'm excited to see it. Um, is there anything else that um, you know you've worked on, work in, like in sound, that you feel is worth the mention? Hmm. I'll think for a second on that. Have you worked on a lot of student films also? Oh, I've done a lot of stu I've worked on a lot of student yeah. films. I, and I, in particular, you found really interesting recently? Um, recently. <laughs> or uh, not recently. Because <laughs> uh, I actually haven't done a lot of uh, work on student films recently. The mm -hmm. Journalism and documentary has really taken up a lot of my time. Yeah. But before that, yeah, I was doing a lot of different, I worked on a lot of short films here at ASU mm -hmm. with a lot of different people. Um, probably the most recent thing I worked on that was really interesting, let me think for a second. Uh, the thing that I'm probably most proud of sound mixing wise that I worked on recently was uh, uh, a short film by a good friend of mine named Max Kurtz called Traction mm -hmm. that he did here. It was his, his student capstone project and uh, that one was a lot of fun and it was really uh, challenging sound wise as well because we ended up having to do a lot of ADR mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of it took place outside so we had a lot of sound issues yeah. so I ended up having to do you know like put in new footsteps and clothes rustle and there were some issues with the mic where we had to really clean it up and I was really proud with the ability of how I had to clean it up because we were having a lot of scratch interference issues and we were able to get that out which was nice but traction yeah it's a really interesting story it's about like kind of two Mormon missionaries and one who kind of has like a, a crisis of conscience kind of thing and mm -hmm. it's having some confidence issues and it's a really touching good yeah. short I, which I recommend. I, re I remember seeing that last semester at the screenings. So it was pretty good. No. I didn't notice much sound problems. <laughs> so congrats on that. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's exactly what I want to hear. I want to hear. I want people to be like uh, not have any sound issues. Yeah. When you don't sound. notice the sound, that's. You did yeah. a good job. <laughs> yeah. People are willing to give forgive bad picture, but they're not willing to forgive bad sound. That's yeah. the first thing that pulls people out of a film, is yeah. sound. Well, awesome. So is there anywhere um, people can follow you, find you, social media? Yeah, uh, Stingray. If you want to learn more about Stingray or actually see clips from the film, uh, there's a few clips online. If you go to facebook.com slash Stingray film, that's the Facebook page where I, I do a lot of posts. I'll probably be posting about this interview afterwards mm -hmm. on there. Uh, and you can follow updates on the film, where to see it, where next screen is going to be. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter. If you follow me at Jared McAvoy, at Jared McAvoy, that's my Twitter. And I tweet about all my other documentary projects. 
I'm actually, I'm the director of photography on another documentary right now that's still very much in the early stages on unsolved murders and serial killers. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I post a lot of stuff about that on there as well, uh, like screenshots from it. Is, and I also do a lot of breaking news. So mm -hmm. if you, you want to know what that car accident was <laughs> all about, you can follow me on Twitter and find awesome. that out as well. All right, guys, don't forget to check out Stingray. Um, and, of course, all his Twitter and all the other stuff that he mentioned just now. Um, thanks for watching, and make sure to tune in every Friday for Within the Frame uh, live streaming. Thanks. Bye.